Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It is an honor and a pleasure to welcome you to the virtual launch of the e-learning course on policymaking, entrepreneurship, and sustainable development, formulating inclusive, green, resilient entrepreneurship strategies. This is a new course developed by UNITA and UNCTAD together, and we're very proud to launch it today. We have an exciting array of panelists, including introductions from the head of investments at UNCTAD and our director, Mr. Alex Mejia. And first and foremost, I would like to welcome Mr. Richard Bowen, Head Investment Research Branch, Division on Investment and Enterprise from OMSAT. Dear Mr. Bowen, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for a kind introduction. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to, to welcome you to this session today. And it's a great pleasure, pleasure to, to launch this, uh, this new product. Um, an e-learning course on entrepreneurship for sustainable development. Um, we've been working in UNCTAD in the Investment and Enterprise Division on uh, entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship policy making for quite a long time. We launched the uh, entrepreneurship policy framework for um, a policy guide for entrepreneurship in 2012. And uh, since then, we've been uh, doing a lot of uh, technical assistance and training on entrepreneurship policy making. The, the guide had um, spin-offs, so we developed specific entrepreneurship policy guides for migrants, for youth, and on uh, so, um, sustainable development oriented businesses. So this has had um, uh, quite a lot of developments over the last, uh, well, nearly a decade. But of course, um, over the last year during the pandemic, entrepreneurship policy making got an additional boost in the sense that um, <clears throat> the impact of the pandemic on small businesses, small entrepreneurs, micro and small and medium sized enterprises has of course been disproportionate compared to the overall universe of firms. Uh, we, we launched uh, just very recently our annual world investment report and in it, you can see analyses that show you that the large firms around the world, on average, lost about 36% in profits in 2020. But uh, our evidence over uh, the different continents in the world show that micro and small and medium-sized enterprises often lost more than 80% of their business. And especially, of course, in, uh, in certain uh, areas, uh, personal services, services sector companies, which are often Especially populated, by, especially populated by smaller enterprises, uh, where the impact of the pandemic has been huge. As a result, um, uh, during this period, we've seen a major spike in requests of governments around the world uh, for technical assistance and policy advice on entrepreneurship promotion. And so our entrepreneurship policy framework is uh, being disseminated more and more. Um, that entrepreneurship policy framework contains um, uh, advice and guidance for governments on many different areas, on uh, the regulatory framework, on uh, technology and innovation, on access to finance, on promoting awareness and networking among small firms, and it includes um, uh, upfront uh, the uh, component of developing a national strategy for entrepreneurship, right? That uh, national strategy for entrepreneurship uh, requires, uh, well, setting and uh, developing such a nat national strategy requires a great deal of stakeholders and policymakers from many, from a wide spectrum uh, of areas around the country. It is interdisciplinary, it includes multiple ministries. Uh, and multiple uh, areas and institutions around the country to develop such a strategy. We've done this in quite a few countries. Um, three of those actually are um, South Africa, Uganda, and the Seychelles. And um, uh, in e these three countries, we uh, helped develop entrepreneurship policies um, for, uh, well, precisely this, uh, youth in South Africa, migrants in Uganda, and the blue economy, so sustainable development oriented uh, aspects in the Seychelles. And it's uh, a great pleasure to see that on the program today for this session, 
we have representatives from the three, three countries to share their experience so we can learn from that as we launch this new e-learning course. I just learned that our representative from South Africa has some problems to connect, so let's hope that we have the person on board today. But either way, we will learn enough from the, from the people present um, that we have in this exciting program today. Um, last but not least, uh, leaves for me just to thank our colleagues and friends at UNITAR who developed with us the e-learning course, basically taking the entrepreneurship policy framework developed by UNCTAD and developing with the expertise of UNITAR a uh, properly structured training course for policymakers and entrepreneurship stakeholders to, uh, to go through our guidance for entrepreneurship policy development independently. The course will be available not just in English, but also in French and Spanish later on during the year. Um, the development of the course is part of a much bigger project. It is uh, part of a project that is called the resurgence of micro and small and medium sized enterprises post COVID. So um, that already shows the importance of this in the current post COVID environment. Um, and so again, thank you very much to our colleagues in UNITAR, but thank you also very much to my own colleagues, um, Philip Rudas and, and uh, to, to start with for the smooth organization of the um, development of the course and of today's launch. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Bowen. It was a pleasure to hear your opening remarks. Next up, I would like to introduce our moderator for today's event, Mr. Alex Mejia. He is the director of the Division for People and Social Inclusion at UNITAR. Dear Mr. Mejia, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, dear Julia. Thank you, Richard, uh, for that very holistic uh, opening, putting in perspective where we are and perhaps uh, why this new um, uh, resource is, is important for UNITAR, uh, the agency that I represent. Um, uh, I'm also very pleased uh, to say that uh, we believe there is high impact and high potential in what we are going to offer today and in the e-learning course that begins uh, next Monday, the 12th of July. So. Um, let me um, uh, say to all of you, dear participants uh, joining us for very many countries, that is uh, my great honor to formally launch the e-learning course on policymaking, entrepreneurship for sustainable development. This course is the result of a joint effort of uh, Junta de Unitar, as our colleagues uh, just mentioned. The development of this tool is part of the project global initiative towards the post-COVID-19 resurgence of the MSME sector, financed uh, by uh, UNTAD and DESA as well. The objective of the project is to strengthen the capacity and resilience of micro, small, and medium enterprises in developing countries and economies in transition to mitigate the economic and social impact of the global COVID-19 crisis. It is part of the UN framework for the immediate socioeconomic response to the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, it aims also at strengthening the competencies required by policymakers and practitioners in developed and developing countries as well as in economies in transition for overcoming challenges on the promotion of sustainable entrepreneurship to facilitate social and economic development and in the implementation of the sustainable development goals. The new coronavirus uh, pandemic, as we all know, uh, dear participants, is having unprecedented impact across the globe, especially on human, human health, social and economic activities. In this context, governments are intensifying their efforts to combat the global spread of COVID-19 by enacting various measures to support public health systems, safeguard the economy and ensure public order and safety, as well as to ensure a resilient, green and inclusive recovery, leaving no one behind. Our Secretary General, uh, Mr. Antonio Guterres, has been for more than a year at the highest possible level in President, Prime Minister's cabinet members, uh, quote unquote, preaching on this thing, on the need to build back better when we um, are uh, we put this uh, pandemic behind. In this sense, entrepreneurs are very important for the solution uh, to the post-pandemic era. We need to keep them afloat and uh, help them with the challenges in any capacity or form. So um, if I, we can go, thank you now to the course proper. Let me show you that there are uh, four, uh, excuse me, five modules. As um, uh, Richard just mentioned, we have uh, done this at UNITAR based on the long and profound research of UNITAR and other partners that um, uh, allow 
for the uh, content uh, and, and the policy guidance proper to be published and released. Now, we are trying to make this um, a little more uh, user-friendly, if I may say, and to offer this to all of you and uh, to other people around the world. There are five models, as I mentioned. Module one is the introduction, the role of entrepreneurship for sustainable development. Number two is entrepreneurship policy framework for sustainable development. You can see on the screen the um, uh, different topics covered by every module. Module three uh, is entitled Optimizing the Regulatory Environment and Improving Access to Finance. Module four, Improving Entrepreneurship Education, Facilitating Innovation and Technology Diffusion. And module five is promoting awareness and networking, very much neither for small uh, and medium, uh, micro, small and medium enterprises. Next slide, please. Now, uh, the objective of the course is very important that we share with you. Uh, allow me to read what you can see on the screen. This e-learning course aims at strengthening the competencies required by policymakers and practitioners in developed and developing countries, as well as in economies in transition for overcoming challenges on the promotion of sustainable entrepreneurship to facilitate social and economic development and implementation of sustainable development goals. At the end of the course, every participant should be able to, number one, recognize the benefits of promoting entrepreneurship and its impact on sustainable development. Number two, describe opportunities and challenges faced by entrepreneurs. Number three, identify relevant policy objectives and policy options. Number four, understand the measures needed to support entrepreneurship. Number five, understand how to develop an action plan, monitor its implementation, and measure its impact. And last but not least, uh, every participant should be able to learn to uh, know intimately best practices on policies, programs, and initiatives in the area of entrepreneurship promotion at national, regional, and global levels. Next, please. Very good. So, how um, uh, can we go about, if you are interested, uh, dear participant, in joining the course, as I said, I will begin uh, uh, next Monday. Uh, it's important that you know the methodology, the participant profile, or target audience, as we call it, and the certification that we offer at the end of the course. First, the methodology. The course is based on ONTAD EPF 2.0 Entrepreneurship uh, Policy Framework for Sustainable Development, as previously mentioned. And also, UNITAR's uh, sound at all uh, learning pedagogical principles, if I may say. Uh, UNITAR has been around since 1963, and this is what we do for a living. So, allow us uh, to invite you to see how this has been structured. Each module includes uh, readings, self assessment activities, and quizzes for a total period of five weeks. The learning activities are distributed in a way to ensure the achievement of the learning objectives in a flexible manner. The participant profile. The course is designed, designed excuse me, for supporting policymakers and practitioners from developed and development countries and transition economies. All of you are invited. The certification. A certificate of completion will be issued to participants who achieve a minimum total score of 70% in the average grade. A certificate of participation, different from the one that I just mentioned, which is a certificate of completion, right? A certificate of participation will be issued to participants who complete all mandatory activities, but achieve a final score inferior, minus less than 70% in the average grade. Uh, next, please. So um, we strongly believe uh, that the development of these tools serve as a reference for working together on similar capacity building initiatives, and we hope that you find it useful. We reiterate our invitation to register for the first iteration of this course by visiting ONTAD's official website or UNITAR official website. And as you can see there, there is a short summary. The course will run from 12 July to 12 September. The suggested duration is five weeks and uh, the registration uh, deadline uh, uh, is there. The uh, first iteration starts on July 12th and uh, that is next Monday. So you are all invited to join us. And I believe that's it, uh, Julia. Uh, very good. So now I'll put the agenda first, again, if you don't mind, Julia. Let me go to the panel proper. And uh, if we can't, uh, thank you, Julia. If we can't uh, mention to you, the participants, uh, this is a very unique conversation because it's a rather practical 
Um, you will see that the questions that I'm going to present uh, to our uh, distinguished speakers, uh, uh, Ryder, thank you so much, uh, really try to um, uh, help us understand three different perspectives from Uganda, from the Seychelles, and from South Africa. Our participant from South Africa was having some um, uh, connection issues, but I believe she will join us uh, by telephone. We will know soon. And uh, these uh, three distinguished uh, panelists will answer the four questions. Now you can go to the question, Julia, if I may, that um, we are going to have on the screen, but we will go one by one. The first one, if I may uh, begin uh, now, uh, is uh, uh, if I may read uh, uh, specifically, uh, and the speakers have already received them. Question number one, how important is it to contextualize entrepreneurship development uh, for development? Of course, nobody will say it is not important, but here I wanted to give the opportunity to our panelists to elaborate on the specific context of their country. The blue economy for the Seychelles, youth and green economy for South Africa, refugee and migrants, entrepreneurship for Uganda. So allow me to begin with Uganda, offering the floor to Mr. Joshua, Joshua Mutambi, the commissioner at the uh, director for micro, small and medium enterprise at the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Cooperatives of the Republic of Uganda. Joshua, thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. And I want to thank the previous presenters, the head of the department and Alex and all uh, uh, fellow participants. Yeah, I think this is a very good uh, topic. First, I want to congratulate you for uh, launching the e-learning course because this is going to be very good for us, especially in the developing countries to enhance our knowledge gaps and all that. Specifically, uh, maybe I introduce myself. I'm called Dr. Joshua Mutambi. I'm the Commission of Pricing and Marketing, as you had already introduced me, in the Directorate of Pricing and uh, Directorate of Micro Small and Medium Enterprise, the Ministry of Trade, Industry, and Cooperatives. Why or how should we uh, contextualize entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurship for development? I think this is very good because we need to understand when, how, and why entrepreneurship uh, should be supported for development and who is, is involved. Uh, right now in Uganda, uh, when it, in terms of the enterprise development, this is the private sector. Uganda is a liberalized economy and uh, led uh, private sector led economy. Accordingly, the private sector in Uganda is predominantly dominated by the micro, small, and medium enterprises, uh, which is about 90%. And the, this 90% of the public sector, public private sector, about 50% is actually informal uh, businesses. So it is important that we try to support entrepreneurship or enterprise development so that we can graduate from the informality to formal businesses. Uh, why, why do we have the uh, largely micro, small, and medium enterprises? This is due to a number of factors. Uh, previously, due to the history of Uganda, uh, largely over 30 years before the, the 30 decades, Uganda was in turmoil. But following the coming in of the government, the current government, NRM, 1986, then we started seeing the recovery of the economy. And therefore, enterprise development, the private sector uh, development became uh, very key on the agenda because we realized that it is through uh, enterprises or private sector development that the economy can grow. Why do we have? micro small medium enterprises because we see that these are due to the other factors for example they try to exploit people try to exploit opportunities different opportunities largely because uh, there are factors like the macroeconomic factors whereby the government will put in policies laws and regulatory frameworks including the institutional frameworks to support 
the development of private sector. We have different ministries, for example, yeah, Minister of Trade, Industry and Cooperatives, Minister of Finance, Minister of Gender, Labor and Social Development. There are so many ministries, and these all work together to ensure that the Minister of Local Government. Then we have departments and agencies, and the, so those are different institutions that support the entrepreneurship or the enterprise development. Therefore, it is important that the we we understand exactly uh, why the enterprise development should take place. Back to why, because we are, Uganda current employment level is very high. I should say that it was uh, the, the gap was reducing, but of course with the coming in or the outbreak of the epidemic we have again got a, a, another problem. Most of the enterprises that had really started their businesses have declined, have closed their businesses because of a number of issues, uh, cash flows, uh, lockdowns, and other uh, factors. So then we have also the issue of the culture, a number of uh, of, of regions within the country, uh, people are known to be good at enterprises. Uganda is known to be an entrepreneurial, actually in the whole world, but definitely uh, because of other factors or weaknesses, then we don't see them thriving uh, beyond five years. So the culture plays a bigger role. The individuals themselves, they also play a bigger role. So it is important that we contextualize the entrepreneurship development uh, so that we can understand uh, when, how, why, and who gets involved. I think I don't want to continue. You have, Mr. Modeta, you have to guide me uh, on how the scope of the answering the question, otherwise I'll continue talking. Thank you. Do you want me to go to the other areas like the government support jo to this process Th thank you commissioner jo just one, one second because we want to put it in perspective uh, also from the case of the uh, Seychelles but thank you for all what you mentioned it, it indeed help us to contextualize uh, entrepreneurship from the, from the point of view of Uganda let me perhaps uh, Michael now offer the floor to you uh, so hopefully if I can introduce you properly and you can put Julia the, the proper slide uh, Mr. Michael uh, Naletambi is the Principal Secretary of the Department of Entrepreneurship of the Republic of the Seychelles, and it's an honor to have you with us, Michael. So if I may, uh, can you help us uh, the same question, right? How important it is to contextualize entrepreneurship development? Very important to focus on the particular case, in this case, of the Seychelles. The floor is yours. Uh, and you're muted, by the way. Uh, sorry, apologies. Very good. Very Thank good. you, Mr. Moderator. My apologies. I did not realize I had mute, muted myself. Um, uh, good afternoon to all. Um, I also want to thank uh, UNITA and UNCTAD for organizing this session and, and actually the course itself, which, is, which will hold a subset of what we really want to achieve. <clears throat> um, I, I will try to respond in a bit of a, a different angle to this. Our take is that entrepreneurship has many shapes and forms, and uh, there is no one size fit all in, in, in terms of the, the development of a country's uh, approach. And uh, the specificities and vision and programs of every country will determine what it wants, uh, how, it, uh, how it approaches the enterprise, um, develop, enter entrepreneurship, sorry, entrepreneurship development uh, strategies. And, uh, If I, I look at Seychelles that, uh, on its own, it's, it's a small group of islands right in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And we, we amount to only 450 square kilometers of land, but spread over 115 islands. And uh, that spread is over 1.4 million square kilometers of sea. We have a population of 
less than 100,000. Um, we have a low manufacturing base. That means the, the population also means a very minute market size. Uh, being islands in the middle of the Indian Ocean, we are also susceptible to the climate change and uh, environmental issues. And being small and dependent highly on imports, we are also susceptible to international and global, uh, global issues and uh, health issues with the pandemic, the pandemic that we are facing now, the health, uh, uh, other health issues, the political and uh, social circumstances or situation in, in major um, countries in, in Europe, in America, in Africa also has implications on our economic situation in the country here. Now, as I say, we have, uh, we are low manufacturing base. We are highly service uh, dependent and mainly the tourism industry uh, supply, su supporting the whole of the economy. And the, the um, but we are situated in the, in the middle of the Indian Ocean with 1.4 million square kilometers of ocean space. The economic, excluded economic zone is 1.4 million square kilometers of sea. That is more than France, a great, bigger than France, uh, Germany and Italy put together. Um, hence, our, our perspective on, on uh, entrepreneurship development cannot ignore that blue space that we have. And hence the blue economy um, principle that we've been championing for many years and been reputed for, for that. The, the resources that it may hold should definitely pro present as opportunities that we need to look at in, 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 that, uh, uh, um, in the development of our entrepreneurship strategy. So definitely it need the con that, that brings us, bring me back to the contextualizing of, uh, of uh, the, the, the strategy that you take or entrepreneurship within the, 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 the development program, the angle that you want to ad address. And uh, as I've picked, spoken now, you can already hear the, the comparison between what um, my colleague from Uganda, Joshua, has just presented compared to our perspective now, the small country right in the middle of the sea and uh, also needing to look at economic growth, economic development, and socio-economic socio development. So um, our perspective would, would be a, a, a lot of based on the ocean space, the blue economy strategy, and uh, which is quite different, I, I would say, from uh, what Uganda and most probably South Africa would have uh, presented to us. Mm -hmm. if I, if mm -hmm. I that, thank you. Uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Michael. A very different perspective, very different reality, uh, similar need, of course, to empower the citizens of our countries, uh, and especially micro, small, and medium enterprise, uh, uh, to, to somehow continue to survive and strive and to uh, achieve better standard of living for the entrepreneur himself or herself, their families, and society as a whole. So, thank you for explaining uh, also the, the geographical and social realities and the essentials. Now, uh, my colleague Philippe from Muta tells me that we have now the, uh, our representative from South Africa. If you can put Julia uh, the slide uh, with her name and title, I will introduce her. Uh, introduce Ms. Pauline uh, Masebe, who is the manager of the Department of Small Business Development of the Republic of South Africa. Uh, Pauline, it's a pleasure to have you through, Philippe. So, uh, Philippe, just confirm that uh, we can hear her. Can you hear me, Philippe? Yeah, I can. I thank you very much, Alex. Yeah, um, um, you can hear me. I don't know if Pulani, are you with us? Uh, she's over my phone, so it's a technological challenge we're trying to overcome. <laughs> to you, Pulani. Yes, I can hear you, and and, and um, my apologies. Good afternoon, um, uh, colleagues. Uh, it's a it's a real pleasure for us to come and, and share our thoughts here. My name is Bulani Masebe from Department of Small Business, uh, responsible for entrepreneurship um, development. We have pro uh, connectivity problems here, but I think I can continue um, if, if all your audience can hear me. Uh, yes, yes, we hear you. The volume is a little low, uh, Philippe, but that's okay. We can understand and we hear. 
So uh, kindly, uh, Pulani, if you can hear me, give us some, some short comments on the reality of South Africa um, uh, as an answer to the first question. The question is, as I'm sure you know, how important is it to contextualize entrepreneurship in the room? Go ahead, please. Opportunity. I just want to uh, outline that for us, the context of, of, of entrepreneurship matters very much because we do understand that the social economic imperatives within the country uh, do be considered for us uh, in informing the national entrepreneurship agenda. We really have high unemployment rates sitting at 32% currently. We also have youth unemployment, which is hovering around 63%. Uh, it's, it's a real challenge for, for our country, uh, people who are not employed. We have a um, high inequality rate in the country, uh, basically uh, the highest amongst uh, most of the con economies sitting at uh, the G in it, uh, and the Gini coefficient is around 63% as well. So you can understand that it's a dual economy. South Africa, we have highly um, uh, technological um, advancements. Uh, we do have that. Uh, and the argument, obviously, of uh, the mainstream uh, entrepreneurship, which advocates for the growth entrepreneurs uh, and the sectors that are highly technologically advanced uh, it's one area but we need to have these perspectives that are balanced not necessarily to follow one we have to also uh, make sure that there's social inclusion uh, as i indicated earlier on that the problem uh, in south africa is that we have a dual economy with technological advancement whereas the margins are also sitting there uh, uh, at the periphery so we just have to make sure that when we set uh, the tone or the theme for the entrepreneurship agenda, we are really informed by all these dynamics. And we really understand that for, for, for us, the context is very important because we have to read from different perspectives. Uh, the perspective, which is an, inter a, a, an individual uh, himself, um, but also the society, the spatial dimensions as well, um, uh, uh, plays a very, very, very important role. The spatial imperatives are important because the president currently has declared uh, that planning should happen at a district level. It's, a, it's, a, it's an emerging model that is currently happening in the country, which we need to take into consideration. So we might want to study the dynamics at a local level uh, rather than only focusing at the national level, we have to go at a, at a local level because I think um, 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 it is important for us uh, to understand those dynamics as well. But more importantly, you must also note that we, although we have high unemployment rates in, in South Africa, the other problem is that we, don't, we have low uh, um, uh, entrepreneurial activity. The entrepreneurial activity is very low um and, and therefore we need to make sure that the agenda talks talks to uh, uh, propel, uh, uh, how we can influence uh, people in the country to actually advance and and be enterprising um uh, to make sure that we, we we improve our total entrepreneurial activity in the country and i think um uh, very importantly for us it's also to understand that, uh, that, that we do understand that uh, entrepreneurship is a, a multidimensional uh, uh, concept, obviously, uh, with multifaceted elements. And, and those elements that are attributed to um, shows the, the, the different lessons that you can put when you design uh, uh, entrepreneurship. So we have to have the lens of a national level. We have to have a lens of a provincial government and how regulatory um, uh, burdens are, affect, are affecting both national level and, 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 and local level. And we have to also look at the, 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 the lens from a perspective of social inclusion, as I indicated, that um, uh, young, young, young people are really 
uh, lagging behind and we have to make sure that they are integrated in the economic mainstream. So I, I think from my side, um, I've captured everything that is important that would help us to shape the, the agenda uh, uh, going forward. Indeed, indeed. Uh, thank you, Pulane. Uh, that was a very holistic uh, description of the reality on the ground of how uh, entrepreneurship development is contextualized in, in South Africa with a high uh, uh, unemployment rate uh, at the same time that you do have impressive assets as a country, not only technology, but, uh, but more than that. So um, I think we have been able to um, uh, cover the first uh, question proposed to the panelists uh, from the general to the specific, right? We are trying to understand here, dear participants, why entrepreneurship development is important, how you should contextualize it to each one of the realities that we are describing here, in particularly, of course, Uganda, the Seychelles, and South Africa. Now, let me postulate the second question for our panelists. How issues related to COVID-19 are integrated in the respective framework of Uganda, South Africa, and the Seychelles? In other words, can our panelists give more detail, and we want you, if I may, uh, to be more specific here, about the immediate response to protect and support entrepreneurs. What happened? What did the government do or civil society do? Uh, will these measures linger on in long-term policy documents, perhaps? Uh, your answers will give us some indication about how COVID is influencing the entrepreneurship agenda. So again, um, please tell us how issues related to COVID-19 are integrated in the uh, respective frameworks in your countries. Let me begin again with Uganda. Joshua, please. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, again, definitely with the COVID-19, uh, which just out, uh, broke out, it disrupted many, uh, many, many issues here, including entrepreneurs. Uh, Uganda is known that the, the majority of the population uh, is the youth. And uh, maybe to relate it to the topic, again, Uganda is the third, I think, largest country in the world to host the refugees and migrants. Currently, we have uh, around 1.5 million uh, refugees. And this is a, a, a population that needs to be engaged. So with the outbreak of the COVID-19, a number of uh, measures were put in place. Uh, currently, we are now in the second lockdown, uh, I think the second wave. Otherwise, in the first wave, we had a number of uh, measures that were put in place by government. To start with, at the macro level, the, 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 were, the private sector was allowed to continue operating, uh, having in place, uh, observing the standard operating procedures. And then of course, we know that they have challenges of access to finance. So most of the institutions, the banking and financial institutions were told to restructure the loans of their clients. The government put in place some also financial uh, measures uh, some, some loans, some support schemes, including the innovation research and innovation fund for the youth so that they can continue while they are not seriously engaged, but they can continue doing research or uh, innovating to support the entrepreneurs. We got uh, different uh, approaches. Others were from development partners uh, who provided either grants or loans, and uh, this included even the, banks, the banking. To mention, for example, like United Development, UNDP, uh, in partnership with other financial institutions, they provided some financing schemes used for business uh, development, whereby the youth would access some uh, loans to continue with their, their businesses. We have United Nations Capital Development Fund that provided some funds and uh, government also through the uh, private sector foundation in Uganda provided some funding. Also through the Uganda Development Bank provided some capitalization of around uh, 100 billion or more to support the entrepreneurs. All of these schemes 
uh, were meant to continue making the enterprises resilient. The banks were told to restructure their loans. That one is okay. And then definitely Uganda's main activity also is agriculture. So agriculture uh, is supported through a number of uh, uh, schemes. Uh, we have organizations like the, the Operation Oyster Creation, National Advisor and Minister of Agriculture that provide the agricultural inputs to those people that are engaged in agriculture, whereby they are given some seedlings, they are given fertil some fertilizers and other inputs to ensure that the economy can continue uh, growing. We developed also some uh, other programs like the youth livelihood programs, like we supported cooperatives because we know that the individuals Youth as individuals may not manage the businesses alone. So we, the government encouraged youth working in groups in cooperatives, and it put some funds in the microfinance support center, which also provided some financing at a minimum, at at, at least a relative low interest rate. Uh, I think now in the Uganda Development Bank or microfinance support center, the interest rate was around 10 to 12 percent. Whereas the commercial banks, the interest rate uh, is now ranging from around 16, 17% to 20%. So all those are the programs that the government has put in place as COVID-19 responses. They, they are, they are, they, we don't stop at financial. We also continue at uh, capacity building, training. Uh, we have other support uh, initiatives uh, others in the office of the prime minister to support the refugees and migrants. We have the, the spotlight initiative to eliminating or reducing gender-based violence. We promote uh, the jobs and wealth creation programs. All these were here to make sure that we continue uh, making the entrepreneurs uh, thriving in this area. We have seen where the other ministries have come in uh, with other uh, programs. I could also talk about the procurement because we know that government largely also uh, is the largest buyer. So we uh, pro a program to support the preferential uh, treatment for small and medium enterprises. As a ministry, of course, that we have introduced earlier on the promoting of the local content by Uganda Build Uganda, largely to support SMEs uh, so that they can thrive in the uh, economy. Uh, then the recent one we are introduced, which is also going to be the parish development model. This parish development model is going to support all entrepreneurs, all the youth, all the people living in urban and rural areas to ensure that they can add value to their raw uh, materials within agriculture. Those that are in digital, we had programs that promoted digitalization, marketing, e-marketing, because it was a, a challenge uh, during the lockdown uh, to access markets face-to-face, uh, -face, physically. So there was a promotion of digital marketing, which has actually accelerated now uh, marketing, especially from the youth entrepreneurs. Thank you. Thanks to you. A very comprehensive uh, uh, way to describe uh, the COVID and what has happened, impact and how has happened. Let me now go to the case of the Seychelles and, uh, to follow the same order. And uh, dear Michael, uh, can you tell us a little uh, about uh, uh, how the COVID uh, uh, related issues are integrated in the framework in your country. Thank you again, uh, um, Mr. Moderator. Uh, um, well, in the case of Seychelles, I think this pandemic, what it really did was expose the dependency on, say, of Seychelles on a single sector, the tourism sector, and our dependence on importation for food security and, and the likes. And it really expo uh, um, exposed the reality to us. 
um, the tourism sector provides for at least 25% directly to GDP. But the implication it has is even greater with the peripheral activities around it. So with the pandemic, the tourism sector shut down completely, so no arrivals. Uh, and uh, the many activities that were related around it also had to close down because there were no tourists, they were based on tourism. Now, what this resulted in, in the collapse of businesses, a potential loss of jobs, the rising of the exchange rates and inflationary implications from there because of the, uh, the base of importation. So what government really did was to, to, to put in place measures to contain uh, uh, the unemployment uh, redundancy rates and uh, also support businesses to remain in businesses. So what we had is uh, what we call the FE4GR, one of the main uh, program was the financial assistance for job re reten retention, which was a program that was put there to um, support the, the businesses mainly the tourism dependent businesses to retain, to retain their, their employees for uh, an extended period and not just close down and make the redundancy happen. Um, it also introduced, government also introduced uh, uh, the small business support scheme where about 100 million rupees was made available to the development bank to provide uh, um, cash flow support. And, and that is uh, important. That, it was more cash flow. Even the central bank also put in, in there 500 million rupees, uh, a separate scheme, a relief scheme for cash flow support. That uh, the idea was to keep those business that can retain remain in business floating, and uh, the loans, actual capital loans, were not were closed. No more new loans for establishment of businesses, but rather to keep what is what is there operating, because there was no no point in having new business come in in a, an environment where everything is falling down, falling apart around it. So those schemes were put in place to, to support those existing businesses. And they were also that for those businesses that were already uh, indebted to, to the banks, there was the rescheduling of their loans so that they can delay uh, um, payment and um, use the, the funding that they have or they gen generate there to can contain their businesses and hold their, their employees. But then it moved, it moved greater into the, now looking at the economic uh, sectors and uh, more, putting more effort into the agricultural sector to increase production and looking now start looking, we are starting now to look at making, putting value addition and processing to our local products so that we can use more of our local products and, uh, and create more of an import substitution within the local. Um, we are pushing for in the, in the fishery sector, which today is still, I would say the bigger sector now, the tourism is just now starting to pick up, um, but we export more, mostly canned tuna, but we have so much more fish around, which we could be doing much more with. So that drive now to expand the diversification within that fisheries sector is, is, uh, the next, is also on, on the agenda and is happening. Uh, land is being made available to investors who would uh, venture into that sector in diversifying, not into canning, but also looking at other value addition, high value addition products. Seychelles is renowned for the, for its, uh, for the quality of its fisheries uh, products. And uh, we, we want to, uh, to capitalize on that, that, that quality that we have. Um, Manufacturing is another, uh, in a sustainable manner, of course, uh, and uh, to the limit that we can, is also another um, agenda that is being pushed. And uh, one important component that we are looking in that area is to look at more of what we have locally in terms of resources and see what can be done more from local resources and reduce the import, import cost to production or, or, or rather than to production, uh, um, to help us um, valorize more of the local resources. I'll give an example that we are now pushing strongly, and that is the cinnamon. We have the highest quality cinnamon. It is not uh, um, farmed, but it is growing in the wild. That means organic. 
and uh, cinnamon products, cinnamon oil, and uh, byproduct, um, value-added products from there present huge uh, um, potential. But today we we view cinnamon as an invasive species, and we just cut and throw away. This has now this pandemic has brought us to look at things in a very very different manner, and uh, we are now um, we've all now put, put uh, made available or we are making available to interested parties the forest area forested areas where cinnamon is in abundance. These can be harvested value addition and we are insisting on the value addition happening before it is export rather than dried and exported where the value is not really harnessed but rather handed over to another external company to add value and, and gain from it so these are these are the, the schemes that have been put in place and uh, we are being explored to to bring greater uh, local entrepreneurship in, uh, supporting into the sustainability and resilience of the country. Thank you, Mr. Alex. Thanks to you, uh, dear Michael. Uh, I uh, believe uh, this understanding of the specifics of how COVID has impacted entrepreneurship uh, actually help us and motivate us. There are very many uh, government officials listening to us today. So the case of uh, Uganda, very important. The case of the Seychelles, of course, are rather different. Uh, with uh, some commonalities. Let me now go to the case of South Africa. So, uh, Ms. Pulane, uh, can you tell us uh, uh, the impact of COVID on entrepreneurship in your country? Thank, thank you. Um, Philippe, you tell us uh, if you still have uh, her on the phone. No, no, she's, th she's there, she's online. Pulane, you are muted. Uh, Yes, very good. Go ahead, Pula. Thank you very much. Uh, Welcome. Uh, no, th thank you very much. I finally made made it. Um, basically, I can say that uh, there is no doubt that uh, COVID-19 is having unprecedented impact across the globe. Um, that's one thing that we need to acknowledge. Um, especially when you look at your human health, uh, uh, health, social, and as well as uh, economic activities uh, that has have been adverse, adversely impacted. The government of, 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 of South Africa has in this uh, uh, context intensified efforts to combat the spread of, of coronavirus by um, obviously enacting various measures of support, safeguarding the economy and ensuring uh, public order, safety, as well as to ensure that SMMEs are resilient, um, especially when you look at <clears throat> uh, uh, the, the township and rural economies, uh, those were the hardest hit. Um, uh, the green uh, economy is something that the president has outlined as a specific area which we need to, to focus on in terms of uh, economic uh, recovery uh, and inclusive, obviously, recovery. I, I've, I've talked about the dynamics within our historical con context in terms of uh, those that were excluded in the economic mainstream, which are largely your youth, uh, women, and, and people with disabilities. So our economic recovery uh, program is very, uh, aware of, of the his historical context and trying to put measures to make sure that they also advance. Uh, we, we, we have also looked at creative uh, solutions, not only to, to, to keep uh, businesses afloat, but also looking at uh, 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 the business expansion processes. So here we are saying business must have the agility that is required. Uh, to, pep, uh, to pivot as well as repurpose their business models in order for them uh, to be able uh, to survive uh, the challenges of COVID and also to expand. In that regard, we have designed uh, financial instruments, um, uh, particularly within your, your township and, and rural economies. Uh, we have uh, um, uh, the automotive, we have the bakery in uh, confectionery, we have uh, the butcheries, um, we have um, uh, the personal care and so forth. But you must also understand that these measures are predominantly within 
the informal sector. With regard to the, the mainstream discourse, um, uh, if I may define what mainstream discourse is, it's about promote the promotion of, 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 of innovative uh, as well as technologically advanced businesses. In terms of that, we have put measures in place. Uh, there is a measure which is the manufacturing support scheme. The manufacturing support uh, scheme uh, recognizes that the fact that um, uh, South Africa uh, do not actually have value added products. We're relying more on import and localization strategy was also put in place to make sure that we have this import, uh, 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 you know, uh, substitutions. So, so, so in a nutshell, uh, the, the, the manufacturing scheme uh, is, 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 is targeting those I, I think so, we so, so basically it's, it's up to a uh, 15 million uh, of, of an amount uh, for each enterprise to make sure that they, they build their systems, um, be it digital skills, uh, as well as making sure that they, 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 they refine their business model in order to serve new clients and maintain existing customers. So, so we, we do acknowledge that um, everything that we are doing um, as entrepreneurship. Uh, I think we, uh, we lost Ms. Pulane, but uh, she was just about to conclude um, in, in this uh, very uh, detailed description of what has been done, how the impact was and what has been done, um, in this case, in the case of South Africa. Um, which is uh, quite all right. So we thank uh, Pulane for um, uh, shedding some light um, on this important issue. Let me now go because I'm very cognizant of the fact that uh, we have used our first hour, so we have only 15 minutes more. Let me go to or 20, uh, if I may. Uh, let me postulate the third question. And the last one I will make very short, but the third question is perhaps the most important when it comes to intra-government uh, coordination, to coordination inside a government because, you know, dear participants, we all understand it's just uh, the nature of the beast that there are many specificities of the um, mandates of different ministries are uh, rather uh, uh, different and the audience that they serve uh, can also be very different. So sometimes we find uh, rather frequently silos and a ministry doing one thing and another ministry doing one thing, but there are transversal, as we call uh, topics, entrepreneurship development, of course, being one of them. So here is the question. And we go with uh, Uganda first, uh, dear Joshua, if I can um, uh, say it aloud. The question is as follows. How important is it to promote a participatory process and strengthen interministerial linkages in the development of entrepreneurship strategies? So please tell us how we should go with the whole of government approach. Joshua, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if, I, if I understand the question very well, uh, is how important is the participatory approaches uh, within the ministries, interministerial linkages, right? Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, definitely we to understand what is participatory uh, approaches. Uh, in my view, and uh, from different scholars, it's a process in which everyone who has a stake in the interventions has a voice either in person or by representation uh, to solve a, a common problem. Now here, in terms of uh, ministries, different ministries, in Uganda, for example, we have the office of the prime minister. We have the office of the prime minister that coordinates all the uh, program activities within the min different ministries. So it brings together different ministries and then makes sure that there is monitoring and evaluation. But uh, generally speaking, we know that uh, uh, there are benefits, the advantages of participatory approaches. 
because there is definitely, uh, then we try to avoid duplication of programs. As I say, that there are different programs and the uh, strategies that are developed by government. Now, when we work in the participatory approach, then we avoid the duplication of programs and the uh, strategies. Then so uh, it helps us to bridge the gap in the knowledge uh, and experience, because then uh, different uh, staff members will be sharing their experiences uh, based on their different expertise. Uh, and then of course, we, we are lucky that we, we also push for the public-private partnership, okay? So we work together with the private sector, civil society and the media to make sure that we don't leave anybody behind so that we are all inclusive. So that whatever that is brought on the table, uh, we try to promote trust and transparency. It brings in issues of accountability. And therefore, uh, for decisions to be made, then uh, different ministries uh, technically uh, or at the top at the political leadership, they would have gone through and agree by consensus. So I think this participatory approach uh, is very crucial and it, it all promotes the synergies, brings together different uh, people at all, uh, all levels. Then also the, there is an issue of commitment because then when we work uh, in a participatory approach, that means that each uh, ministry, each organization should be committed to their areas of focus. So I, I think this is very good. And then uh, definitely uh, a participatory approach, you work together to make sure you solve the political issues, the social and economic development issues. That is how I understand it. And then we, it has also helped us to develop uh, different laws, policies, and uh, regulatory uh, frameworks. Thank you. Uh, thanks to you indeed. And uh, uh, also thank you for sharing uh, uh, your experience on, on this. So again, um, we are talking to our participants on how to strengthen uh, interministerial linkages when it comes to entrepreneurship strategies. So, let me now offer the floor to the representative of the Seychelles, Your Michael. Uh, you have the microphone. Thank you again, Alex. Uh, uh, um, I, I think you, you said it in your opening uh, statement just before the question. Um, entrepreneurship is actually a multidimensional uh, and very much cross-cutting cross uh, subject. Now, that means that it, it ropes in many different institutions and bodies and, and people. And in that, in, in that light alone, it tells you that it is absolutely important that if you're going to develop any strategy on entrepreneurship, it has to be done in a participatory manner. So the, the, the necessity of participation and inclusiveness is paramount to, to any strategy, the entrepreneurship development strategy that you would be working on. Um, but what, what I see from there is not only that you, you bring in the understanding of specific uh, um, body to the other, other stakeholders' interests or concerns, but you also now acquire uh, that understanding. The, 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 what, what they acquire from that understanding brings added value to the establishment of an appropriate system that fits the multiple uh, issues that are, in, are being addressed. So it, it, does, it does not uh, allow, it, 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 it prohibits, it, it prevents uh, um, gaps in the system, right, which we will not otherwise need to go back and, and fix uh, 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 as a, a system that would be done behind the desk alone uh, um, would cause. Uh, in, in, in the case of Seychelles, we've, we've uh, done the IPI investment policy review process and uh, we combine that with entrepreneurship uh, um, assessment as well and uh, with these issues of the interlinkages were also highlighted as a necessity because they were as you had mentioned as well silo in certain instances silo approaches to different 
mechanisms and the implementation uh, became very, very difficult. So um, that, that uh, IPR exercise highlighted a lot of the issues there. In fact, <laughs> if I may use this opportunity, uh, we are going to approach uh, UNCTAD now to help us uh, um, develop that um, uh, entrepreneurship strategy uh, for Seychelles so that we do it really in that participatory manner. You know, we, we, say, we are told that, we are always told that no one is a prophet in his own country. So bringing in that external support would probably help us do better in terms of harnessing the participation of uh, the different bodies to make sure that we and we have something that is that ends up to be inclusive and uh, effective for our our needs. Thank you. Uh, thanks to you, and I can only attest uh, to what uh, you say in regards to the cooperation between the government and UNTAD. I am from Ecuador in uh, South America, and I have seen what UNTAD um, uh, can do when working closely with the government, uh, the government that I serve a few years back. So I encourage you to pursue that uh, partnership. There is a lot of expertise and uh, uh, wisdom at, at, uh, with our UNTAD colleagues. Very good. Let me um, uh, stop there uh, before we go. Um, uh, to the case of uh, uh, South Africa. Again, uh, very briefly, uh, Polani, before you take the floor. Let me, uh, in addition to, to the question, right, uh, which is um, how to strengthen uh, interministerial linkages in the development of entrepreneurial strategies, uh, perhaps you can also give us an example of what uh, uh, your department of small business development um, uh, can do in practical terms to reach to other ministries as well. Perhaps uh, that, that should uh, motivate many of our participants today. So the floor is yours, Polane. Thank you again for, for being with us today. Um, uh, thank you very much. Firstly, we, we acknowledge the fact that um, we have to have a systems perspective. Uh, much of the, uh, the, the, the challenges of um, a participatory approach uh, is that different uh, departments are in silos. Uh, they are very territorial. Uh, they don't see us crossing the boundaries, but the reality of the matter is that entrepreneurship development, um, you, we have to uh, recognize the intersections um, uh, within different domains. So um, uh, we, we have started engaging uh, with different departments, um, especially when you look at your, our education system. The education system is very bad. Um, we do not chain entrepreneurs and it is our responsibility as the Department of Small Business, as well as our mandate to make sure that we promote entrepreneur, entrepreneurship. Currently, the, the, the country does not have a strategy um, uh, to anchor all the activities that are relevant for us uh, to take um, entrepreneurship to a different level. Yes, we talk about entrepreneurship, but the reality of the matter is that it's just a lip service. Um, um, we, do, we did um, uh, engage the Department of Higher Education. We have uh, uh, designed a concept there where we developed what we call the Centers for Entrepreneurship within our TVET colleges as well as the, the universities. So we've got Centers for Entrepreneurship now um, uh, and uh, they are struggling to even have policies around entrepreneurship itself. So I think um, UNCTAD comes very handy, obviously with the knowledge and expect, expertise to guide um, also the universities in terms of how do we actually integrate um, uh, entrepreneurship cu curriculum um, into different faculties, into different technical fields. Um, as, I, as I told you, entrepreneurship students might see it as a viable career option. We should not uh, churn out um, uh, and, uh, or, or, or students that are only job seekers, but we must um, teach them that their mindset should be more entrepreneurial and they must come up with enterprising uh, ideas. That is why currently as a, as a department, we also design what we call the, the Youth Challenge Fund in order to stimulate um, a entrepreneurial culture within the student population. Uh, we are partnering, obviously, with the other organizations because we realize we cannot achieve that goal alone. And that's what uh, I, I, I refer uh, to this program uh, that we have currently designed that we need to also learn and draw 
policy lessons, um, uh, you know, so that um, we, we, we can be able to roll it out across the country. I believe that it will uh, make a significant contribution towards reducing um, the unemployment rate of, of young people. So it's, it's, it's one area that we manage and we are co still continuing to make inroads. But, but secondly, we do have um, uh, the, the science and innovation uh, department. Uh, and we don't necessarily talk, um, uh, obviously, but I think my key recommendation when we design uh, the strategy is that we must have a planning committee uh, uh, from the Department of Science and Technology Department of Higher Education uh, and other relevant bodies, the Na National Treasury, for an example, we are currently doing the, the, the mapping of youth uh, support systems. So we need to integrate them into one particular planning uh, committee so that when we reach out to their department, already they are there, they are part It seems that we lost uh, Pulane. Pulane, can you hear us? Okay. Uh, but, but she did uh, uh, gave us some uh, very specific examples, uh, of course, on how uh, to break the silos, how to promote a participatory process and strengthen interministerial linkages when it comes to entrepreneurship strategies. Yeah, very good. Let me go now. Uh, we have only a couple of minutes, so I, I kindly ask uh, the three distinguished uh, panelists to give us a very short answer because it's a very specific question, but an important one. An important one because it will guide us at UNTA and UNITAR on how to uh, leverage this e-learning course that we are uh, uh, launching today. The question that I believe you have received before uh, uh, is as follows. How useful is the use of e-learning courses to foster interministerial linkages? So the same on how to have a whole of government approach, how to engage with several departments or ministries using this e-learning, give us ideas. How, how useful do you think this is, uh, uh, this type of devices as, as an e-learning course? So uh, let me also start uh, with the representative of the Republic of Uganda. Joshua, you have the floor, you are muted. Uh, you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, obviously uh, with the current situation now, we have no choice but to go for, uh, e-learning, e-commerce, and other areas that can uh, utilize the digital applications and solutions. So we feel that the e this e-learning course uh, will be very useful uh, to foster linkages. Uh, in, a, in a sense that, for example, even right now, we are already communicating with the, you people from, uh, I think uh, this is uh, Austria or you know, Geneva. We have Seychelles, we have South Africa. So this course will bring together different people with different minds. And it is easier to share, again, experiences. I'm sure it will be participatory, as we are saying, the course will be participatory. So people will be able to ask different questions or challenges they face in their different jurisdiction. So it will be able to foster uh, linkages in a way, because uh, not only that, because uh, some of our participants, I'm sure, will be business uh, people, entrepreneurs, that will be looking for markets, that will be looking for raw materials, looking for technology. So uh, it brings together uh, different people uh, from different uh, uh, atmospheres. Then, of course, uh, as we say, uh, e-learning, the material sharing of the material would be very easy. You can retrieve the material, you can store it, retrieve it when you want to it, uh, which is different from the physical face-to-face -face hard, hard, hard paper materials. So in my view, I think this is okay. And uh, then it also creates the networking. It enhances networking. And uh, long lasting, I think now we realize that we are a global village. The people will always be together uh, whenever we are faced with this, such challenges. Uh, so I think it is good that this course is going to be uh, E 
Yeah, and it can be done anywhere. You see, you don't need to be brought in a, a specific space. One can be at home, like right now we are working from home. You can, uh, using the digital applications, you can have it on your phone, you can have it on your laptop or your computer. So I think the challenges of accessing the course are going to be simplified in my view. Yes, uh, of course, the, the cost is terrible. Thank you. Thanks to you, Joshua, uh, very, very good indeed. Now, uh, for our colleague, Michael from the Seychelles, I will actually present another uh, question, but you can also add uh, any suggestions on how to leverage the uh, e-learning course that we are launching today. But uh, the other question I, I find very interesting, Philippe uh, just helped me uh, know that. It comes from Chile, from a participant by the name Nicolas Donke. Nicolas, we thank you for taking the time to be with us and to write this question. So I'm going to present it to the representative of the Seychelles. Nicola say, what is the information gap that needs to be filled on the process of emergence and development of new ventures, of new MSMEs? What is the information gap? How, how do we take, uh, uh, Michael, all these things that we know in government, all these devices, all the resources, and bring it, especially to young people that want to develop new ventures? How do we gap? How do we fill that gap? Michael. Uh, you're muted still. Yeah, I, I, I think this, this question really caught me off guard. You've thrown <laughs> me off guard. But anyway, I, I, I think uh, it's an important, a very, uh, very important question. Um, how do we make available the, the, the information that is uh, um, available, but not accessible to, to the young people who want to venture into businesses? I think this is a very important question, but um, if I can bring it back to this particular question that I was meant to answer is that e-course is one way of accessibility of capacity building. I think uh, Joshua was alluding to that as well. And that was one of the points I wanted to make is that the, the training, the capacity building that this e-learning course provides is one of the dimensions that can be made available uh, um, uh, to make it accessible before maybe you have to move physically with costs and everything to to access such such an knowledge, built up as as in the beginning we were we were explained, built up uh, in over years, and uh, over numbers of experts by Angtad and and Unita, putting it together into one one uh, program where people can access it from from the the comfort of even of even their own bedrooms. That's that's an important component that this course, and I, I I'm trying to relate that question to to the actual question of how useful it is. But I think this is, this is important. But it also brings me to the point of the, the silos that we talked about in the previous question. Um, not only that do we have sometimes silos, is that the information that these entities hold are not public. And uh, hence this question that the, 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 the person from Chile has asked. We need to, to publish more of these questions, uh, these, these requirements and uh, statistics and data uh, through websites or even through publications in hard copy and, 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 and now even even the social media facebook instagram and all make this information available upfront not on request but upfront and let people even again in the comfort of their own bedrooms or or, or living rooms have uh, on, on their own uh, terms or on their, at their own pace, the, the, the information that is required. But it needs to come from that entity, making that, uh, that, that, that first step as we generate the information, as we generate uh, these decisions and uh, requirements to uh, um, let it be known publicly uh, as, as in the first, first uh, available instance. If I, if I, I hope I have answered the question. Uh, very, very well, actually, you answered both. <laughs> so thank you, Michael, for being very, very proactive and holistic. Let me now go to the last question, um, uh, now for our representative from South Africa, the last question of this very interesting webinar. Uh, and it's a question, if I may say, Pulane, that is uh, uh, in everyone's mind, the elephant in the room. I think you touched on it briefly, I know your colleagues as well but it's uh, financing for entrepreneurship. Uh, uh, we had several people that wrote, uh, one asking specifically for the case of Uganda, another one for the case of South Africa. 
but I wanted you to tell us uh, perhaps in general terms, um, how access to finance uh, can be ensured? What perhaps is the role of uh, banks or, or micro lending banks, but what can we do? What should we understand when it comes to access to finance? Because you see very many um, entrepreneurs, especially young entrepreneurs have a beautiful idea, have knowledge, have all what they need or most what they need except financing to actually launch uh, this in, in its initial phase, a, 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 a nascent a company or initiative. So can you give us Punani, some comments on access, in, access uh, to finance for entrepreneurship, please? Um, Alex, this question was for Pulane, right? Yes, correct. Right, she, she got disconnected and just connected to my phone. So can you briefly repeat the, the question address to Pulane? She hears ah, us now. Absolutely, absolutely, Pulane. I, ah. You are back. I can actually see you now. <laughs> so, so thank you for that. Access to finance. Any comments, Joseph? This is the last question. And it's a pleasure to have you closing, perhaps, uh, this part. So, Pulane, uh, what do you think uh, we could do, governments could do, to ensure access, access to finance or at least to motivate the banking sector and the micro lending to make uh, funds available for a small micro and medium um, entrepreneurs, access to finance. To you, Polanda. Okay, Th thank you very much. Um, firstly, we need to understand what are the constraining factors um, and whether government is willing to de-risk uh, entrepreneurs in some sense, because if you want the banking sector to come on party, you must be able to, to, to de-risk um, the entrepreneurs. And we've got what we call the credit guarantee scheme in, in, in South Africa. Um, when, when entrepreneurs go and, 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 and apply for loans, uh, government has put um, a lot of funding uh, for, for this risking purposes. But we also have uh, 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 other measures, support measures uh, that make sure that we, we promote or facilitate access to finance. We've got our agency called called CIFA, which is the agency that would uh, channel funding to to micro enterprises. But when they do this, now we have what we call a blended funding model, uh, where we give a particular percentage, which is a totally grant, and then a, a loan component in it, um, a, a, as a way of us to encourage them uh, to not only take loans, but we are pushing them uh, uh, halfway. So. I think um, uh, for me, it, it, it's, it's government intervention and support, uh, but also to lobby the bank, uh, the banking sector. We have managed, I think, to lobby and partner in, in implementing a different programs to partner the, the banking sector. Uh, we've got the APSA uh, on board, we've got the Net Bank, we've got Standard Bank uh, coming on board and partnering with us and even incubating these entrepreneurs, because sometimes it's not only by, only facilitating um, a, a financial support, but also to make sure that they are incubated, they are provided with mentorship, but also they have uh, business development support. So the banking sector is coming handy to extend their hands in saying over and above uh, the access to finance, we're gonna make sure that we're supporting you with business development. And, and that is what government is doing. And even the national treasury is, is acknowledging that uh, uh, we are risking uh, entrepreneurs and they are putting more money um, uh, into the credit guarantee scheme. Thank you. Very, very good. Um, I think uh, very many ideas in, in, in understanding the new comments and the, what is happening in this sense, access to finance in South Africa. So. Uh, dear the panelists, uh, thank you very, very much for taking this time, um, uh, Joshua, Michael, and Polane. As uh, Unta uh, proposed at the beginning, I have seen how having the three of you, three different perspectives, three different realities, but several um, uh, common factors when it comes to entrepreneurship and a lot of knowledge indeed, uh, uh, it work. And it worked beautifully because I'm sure the more than 100 participants that we still have after one hour and a half, sorry that we went beyond the, the scheduled time, but uh, uh, it's been a good conversation. And I just need to say one last thing on behalf of uh, uh, UNTA and UNITAR, and uh, in answering uh, several questions that I saw uh, on the chat uh, from the floor, from the participants. One is um, who can register for this new learning course? And the answer, I think uh, Marta and Julia already replied to some of those, is anyone, 
anyone can register. Of course, our main emphasis is government officials, but also civil society organizations, um, anyone that is an entrepreneur, so as to understand the policy framework and how entrepreneurship actually should work from all the perspectives that I presented before when I was showing the modules. And the last question to answer already succinctly is how much is it uh, for the registration? And it gave, me, it gave me great pleasure to say that is zero. Um, uh, there is no registration fee as it should be. Uh, this is open to anyone. Uh, the only thing that we kindly ask you, dear participants, is that you actually complete the course. It's a lot of effort from on that, a long time before in preparing these um, uh, policy guides and all the research, all the investigation, all the writing, all the um, uh, peer um, uh, review and so on. And then from UNITAR, of course, with the support of UNTAD in actually doing something that is um, uh, user-friendly. So there is no cost. There is an obligation, which is uh, hopefully you take the time. It's not many hours per week uh, to actually complete the course. And with that, I would like to thank uh, the team at UNTAD, uh, Richard, Philip, um, uh, uh, thank you for the excellent work that you do. And also my uh, own team, Marta, a uh, focal point at UNITAR uh, with UNTAD and Julia, thank you for putting together uh, this most excellent webinar. Thank you, dear colleagues. Uh, thank you to our distinguished panelists and thank you to all the participants. Now I adjourn this unique uh, webinar and I invite you to watch it again if you want uh, or to send the link uh, from the UNITAR YouTube channel for the proceedings. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.